Hey, thanks everybody for signing in. And uh, it looks like we have about 220 folks online. Thank you so much for joining us today. And thanks also to the members of the leadership team from across the campus uh, who have signed in as members, uh, as panelists uh, to answer any questions that you might have. And uh, thanks for the great kickoff to the spring semester as well. I know that it takes a lot of uh, energy and kind of exit velocity to get ready uh, for the spring semester. And uh, thanks for all that everybody's done to make sure that we deliver a great experience for our students and, and for one another. And for today, we'll run this like we've done town halls in the past and use the question and answer, the Q&A feature uh, to pose questions. And if you have questions, um, perhaps you can start posting them now uh, as I give some introductory comments. Um, and that way we, we can hit the ground running uh, to answer those questions that you have. Um, let me begin by thanking all who made the, the launch of the UND Leads Strategic Plan event last week, the launch event, go so well. In particular, let me thank uh, Jim Machorek and Lynette Kronelka for their leadership over the course of nearly a year of the Strategic Planning Committee. And uh, specific thanks also to Anna Clark and Rob Carolyn for their tremendous support uh, to make that whole enterprise function so well. I'd like to offer a couple points of welcome as well. And I'm looking across my panelist list to see uh, if they're here. The first is is Dr. Art Malloy, who is, who's our new Vice President for Student Affairs. And Art, are you here? He might uh, not have signed on yet, but he'll be here in a moment. Uh, let me then turn to Carla Mojon Stewart, who we announced before, but I figured I would welcome her yet again and uh, say thanks, Carla, for serving as our Vice President for Finance and Operations. And uh, good afternoon to you. Thank you, Dr. Armacost. I'm so excited to be here and serving in this new role. Um, I know many of you on campus from my prior role as the Associate Vice President, and I could not be more excited about serving the university in this new role, and I hope I will um, serve us all well and, and um, continue to help UND move forward. I'm very proud to work here and really proud of the work we're doing, so thank you. Great. Thanks, Carla. It's uh, great to have you as part of the senior leadership team, and thanks for your many years of support to UND. In addition, I'd like to welcome Dr. Randy Tanglin, who is our new vice provost for faculty success and uh, or faculty affairs. So, Randy, good to see you. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, President Armacost. I met many of you when I was on campus in October uh, for my interview. I'm happy to finally be here on campus. Um, and, and really excited to be part of the campus community here. And I look forward to being a resource for the faculty and to just being there for the faculty as you support your students and the mission of the university. Great to be here. Great, thank you so much and uh, welcome aboard as well. Um, we're, we're delighted to have you as part of the UND community. And then to many new folks who might be uh, new to the campus who joined us uh, between the fall and spring semester, welcome uh, to UND, welcome to Grand Forks. We're, we're thrilled that you're, you're part of the team and uh, we look forward to many years together. And uh, I, I thought I would also uh, bring up a couple key points that we've talked about in the past, uh, a quick update on the repatriation work that's happening for our Native American ancestors um, that were found on campus um, uh, beginning last March and the efforts that we've been taking. We have, um, we have a moral obligation to make sure that the ancestors return uh, to their homelands, to their tribal lands. And, uh, and the university and I have expressed our deep apology for, for um, being in this situation and for um, past actions that have led us uh, to this point, but please know our strong commitment, our, our undying commitment to, um, to make sure that, um, that we continue this work uh, and, and to bring the ancestors uh, again to their, to their homes. Um, we're working with Dirt Divers LLC. That's our, uh, our repatriation uh, consultant that's been working uh, tirelessly for the last almost three months uh, to make sure that uh, that we do this with the respect and dignity that's required. And our commitment to this project and this effort is unwavering as a campus. On the discovery side, uh, since discovery uh, is, is something we do as a campus, the, the research, the creative pursuits, the innovation that happens on our campus, um, it plays a central role to what we do. And uh, it's certainly reinforced by the UND LEADS strategic plan as one of our pillars. Um, it was uh, important for me to wait for that plan to see the concepts that emerged um, 
Uh, I know many on campus have been waiting about uh, to hear the plans of of how we are moving forward with a search for the vice president for research and economic development. And that will happen. Um, we're, we're launching that process uh, shortly. Uh, we're building the, the search committee as well as in the process of, of beginning the hiring process for a, um, a, uh, a search firm that's going to assist us in that search. Um, but um, the goal is to make a selection, hopefully by the 1st of October, perhaps sooner if things fall into place uh, very quickly. Um, so that's uh, an important note for all of us. And I do see that Dr. Art Malloy um, is, is aboard. And Art, welcome to UND. This is uh, your first big town hall for the campus. We're glad you could be here. And uh, perhaps you'd like to say a few words of welcome. Well, I'd like to say um, I'm really excited about being here. And uh, I believe I've hit the ground running. I've been in a lot of meetings uh, so far and uh, getting a chance to meet students and, and, and our student groups and just looking forward to doing uh, uh, some things to, to, to create uh, more, more, more ideas about uh, campus wellness for, for our students, but, but also um, something that uh, the students told me that was extremely important to them and that is to, uh, to, to try to bring back the, the vibrancy uh, on 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 campus with our with our student program. So, uh, looking forward to to working with all of the directors in, in student affairs, and 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 of course, looking forward to to working with uh, those of you that are not in, in student affairs also to to do the very best job we can do for our students. Well, Art, thanks so much for being here, and we're so thrilled to have you as part of our leadership team and to be a vital member of our campus and and offering so much support to our students. And then the next point, and, and Art, if you turn off your camera, we won't oscillate back and forth between the two of us as, as we talk. Um, the, uh, the last thing I wanted to mention is uh, the legislative session is in full swing. Uh, we've been at it for a few weeks now. We're tracking many bills uh, and more are emerging by the day. At some point they'll, they'll peak and they'll stop. Um, and we meet weekly with the North Dakota University system and the other presidents and leaders across the state every Friday uh, to learn more about upcoming testimony, to make sure we're aligning uh, our, our messaging across the campuses, and to discuss and debate the issues that uh, are being forwarded as part of legislative bills. Um, the issues we're tracking include funding and how higher ed is funding, issues of pay for faculty and staff, uh, issues of inflation and how we respond to inflationary matters, uh, issues of academic freedom, certainly issues of equity and justice, and uh, and one of the areas that's uh, getting the attention of faculty members is the issue of tenure and restrictions or qualifications that are being placed or proposed to being placed on tenure. And you have to know our involvement includes both formal and informal engagement. Uh, this could be formal testimony in front of committees, it could be responding to individual questions from legislators, meeting with groups of legislators from, uh, from the local area or from across the state, uh, advocacy uh, from our campus to the NDUS leadership and to the State Board of Higher Education, and also certainly coordination with other presidents. So, um, so you'll hear or um, you might not hear about um, work we're doing uh, across the state to make sure that the interests of uh, our campus community are taking are taken into account as we go through the legislative session, uh, but we will keep you up up to date through our website. It's um, Melanie. I think it's uh, und.edu/legislative has much information about um, about the process that we're going through, and and there we'll have a link to a bill tracker that will show uh, the status of bills that we're following. I I got a smile from Melanie there, so I think uh, I think I got it right. That's und.edu/legislative. That's legislative. Okay, good. And with that, let me stop talking and we'll allow Melanie to take the stage and uh, she will she will direct traffic here and make sure that uh, we're answering all the questions that are coming forth through the Q&A. So Melanie, over to you, thank you. Right. Thank you, President Armacost, and thank you to everyone who's joined us this afternoon. We're gonna kick it off right away. We started getting some, some questions and um, I'm gonna send the first question to Provost Link. And it's regarding the tenure bill. It's it's HB 1446. President Armacost did reference this in his opening remarks. It, the question is: This bill is currently written as a pilot program. DSU President Easton stated in a forum article, "The hope is the hope was the policy would apply to all NDUS campuses eventually. 
what is UND's position on HB 1446 and how and will you work, you work with it? your NDUS peers to oppose this bill and protect tenure? Vice President Linder, thank you so much and thank you uh, for the question. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, nice to see you virtually. Uh, I'll offer a few thoughts and then I will hand it off to President Armacost to add whatever he may like to add to this discussion. Uh, House Bill 1446 is of considerable interest uh, to all of us on campus, as you can imagine. Uh, it comes in three sections. If you get a chance to read the bill, it's not very long. Section one uh, has to do with a pilot program uh, that is specifically designated for a couple institutions, not UND, but a couple other institutions within the NDUS system, uh, having to do with the way in which uh, faculty uh, are uh, uh, faculty salaries are covered by revenue generation through tuition and grants and so forth. The second section uh, addresses tenure specifically. Uh, it grants the authority to presidents uh, to undergo at their, um, uh, at their discretion uh, independent reviews of tenured faculty and to make judgments uh, based on those reviews about whether a tenured faculty member should be retained or dismissed from the institution. Uh, and notably uh, in that section, there are no um, process protections, uh, there are no appeals and so forth. Uh, we are of course quite concerned about this and have taken a very keen interest. Uh, when this bill uh, first came out, uh, one of the first things that we have tried to do is get some clarity of interpretation regarding this bill. Uh, the way the bill is drafted, it is a little bit unclear as to whether the provisions regarding the tenure review in Section 2 apply to all system schools or apply only to those two schools that are singled out for the pilot program in Section 1. Uh, so we've already been having uh, the president and I, the general counsel, uh, folks at the system have been having some conversations about how to get some clarifying amendments written for this bill, should it pass, uh, that would clarify whether that section two applied to uh, us here at UND and indeed to all system schools or only to those schools in the pilot program. However, uh, a pilot program, if deemed successful, can be expanded uh, at a later date to include all system institutions so uh, even were that clarifying language to be put in place, uh, we are of, uh, we have a keen interest in this particular bill. Uh, I think I speak for all of us, at least I suspect so, uh, when we uh, share our appreciation uh, for the historical basis for tenure in the university system and the protections it affords for academic freedom. We are also, of course, concerned about in, um, how this affects due process. Uh, we are concerned about uh, the implications for shared governance uh, across the institutions as well. Uh, so we're taking a keen interest on this. Uh, I'm gonna hand it off to President Armacost uh, to add in a word or two here. Uh, we are still trying to, of course, work with our colleagues across the system and uh, at the NDUS level to get information about how the the position of the state board and the system. President Armacost. Great, thanks, Eric. I appreciate those great comments. Um, just to add, I I actually haven't read the article that quotes President Easton. I will see President Easton on Thursday at our state board meeting, and undoubtedly, uh, this particular bill will be a topic of discussion. Um, and I think uh, Provost Link nicely uh, referred to the long history of the connection between tenure and academic freedom. And the AAUP uh, talks about that important connection as well as anyone. And so for anyone who needs to go back and, and read it, go to the aaup.org website and they have great uh, discussion points and great, uh, great writings about that important connection, academic freedom and tenure. I think anything, any changes to tenure have to be seen as um, especially limitations uh, have to be looked at to see what's the impact on on academic freedom and and the rights of 
of faculty members to that academic freedom. So these have to be looked at. We should also look at what policies are already in place under a current either campus or NDUS policy about what protections are in place or, or are there safeguards against um, against uh, the concerns that are probably leading to the proposal of this bill, namely is our tenured faculty members protected um, fully against any negative actions they might take. But there are lists in our policies about what what's the threshold that it would take to remove a tenured faculty member. And those have been discussed and debated, um, but those I don't think have been part of the conversation uh, with respect to this bill. But there are protections that are offered um, to keep uh, faculty members from um, abusive behavior or criminal behavior, or uh, there, there's a good list within policy. So um, so faculty, tenure does not mean unfettered access to do whatever a faculty member wants. Um, there are reasonable expectations for, for performance and behavior that are already in place, and those need to be considered as we debate this bill as well. Um, so anyhow, I, if, if, if you want to see the full discussion at the board meeting, uh, feel free to tune into the board meeting on Thursday. Um, I will withhold any uh, any comments of debate um, with, uh, with colleagues uh, until I get to that point to do it in that form. Thank you, Provost Lincoln, President Armacost. I'm going to direct our next question to our Associate Vice President for Human Resources, Peggy Varberg. There were two questions regarding our market analysis study. Um, one, just a question about the market analysis, and the other was about the timeline, when it would be completed. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Peggy. Thanks, Melanie. Um, yes, we have just received three official proposals just this last Friday. And so we're in the process of um, vetting those and um, starting to review. We'll have a, a group that um, will review the, the proposals and then make a decision as to which one is appropriate for the university. Uh, timelines, these are not simple processes. They can take six to nine months to complete. And we are talking about all benefited employees, so faculty and staff. So that's a number um, that sits around um, 2,700 to 3,000 uh, uh, benefited employees, um, depending on the given time, right? Um, so we're excited about doing this. We're excited about um, uh, discovering where, um, where we can go, what work we need to do, putting an action plan together, um, and then um, disseminating that across to all areas. Um, as far as what... Um, what data is going to be available um, to the to the public? Certainly, the outcome will be, um, the plan will be, um, to a certain extent. Um, there is uh, attorney privilege in here um, of raw data, um, so we have to walk down that line to see how that applies to um, uh, UND and US state um, entities. So we we're still working on um, that process, but we are excited. We think we've got some good proposals. Um, uh, historically, we we sent uh, two RFPs out um, and they failed. Um, part of the reason is some of these companies, these consultants that do this work are having the same issues that most other entities across the country um, are having, and that's with staff. So staffing and the bandwidth and the ability to do a project this, this size, it's fairly large. Um, so again, excited about outcomes, hoping to get the good data so that we can be make sure we're on the right path um, with our pay equity compensation structure. Thanks, Peggy. I'm gonna direct this next question back to you, see if you can answer it for us. It's The question is December, uh, December 21st, there was an all facilities meetings for all employees that was canceled. Can you let the campus know if it'll be rescheduled? That, yeah, we'll have to, I'm gonna to have to defer to uh, AVP Peeper from facilities that, that I believe was a, a meeting that was in his house. I'm I'm not aware of it otherwise. Uh, yes, it'll be rescheduled. Um, we were trying to get the legislative session started so we could share a little bit of the activity going on. Um, and so we just delayed the meeting, but it will be rescheduled. All right, thanks, Mike. Uh, the next question, I'm going to pass over to our special assistant to the President for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, Tom, Dr. Tom Bakui. Tom Bakui, would you um, respond to, will UND take a stand against HB 1474, amongst others that are attacking the trans community and the DER work? These will impact campus and our community members, but also hinder our ability to grow our campus and recruit new faculty and staff and students. 
President Linder. I, I appreciate um, the opportunity to speak on this question. Thank you for posting the question. Uh, I think as I'll go back to what President Armacha said at the beginning of uh, the town hall today, uh, we are tracking these bills and these bills, um, there are several bills that have implications as it relates to our LGBTQ plus community, not only um, at UND, but in our community large in terms of grant forks. Um, and so I, I think the, the, the thing for us is we're, we're trying to track them. Um, and we're also trying to figure out what does it look like across the, the system in terms of other the other public institutions and their perspectives on these bills. Um, my concern always is thinking about human rights um, and, and the concern in terms of how that impacts human rights. So uh, without saying too much in terms of us uh, and where these bills are gonna go, I think we're continuing to watch them. We're continuing to watch um, the sessions as they come out and, and um, seeing what's happening. I think the other thing that, that President Armacost mentioned is uh, when we are called whether to testify or to give testimony, uh, with regard to where we stand in support or opposition of certain bills. And so we'll continue to do that. Uh, I'm sorry for, for not being able to offer more information beyond that, but I think this is what we'll continue to do and continue to, uh, for me and for all of us at the EC um, or in, in leadership at the university, I encourage you all, please share your thoughts. Please email me concerns um, and I'll make sure that I can voice those with the rest of the executive council and, as well as President Armacost as we start thinking about the impact of these bills. Thank you, Dr. Bailey. All right, the next question, I'm gonna direct back to Peggy Varberg. Peggy, there is considerable conversation about the, ch the changing of the ND PERS healthcare plan. What can you share with us and what is the administration and the State Board of Higher Ed's thoughts on protecting the plan as it stands today? Um, yeah, <laughs> this is a, 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 a lofty one for sure. Um, I, I, you know, I can't really speak to the state board. Maybe um, President Armacost has a little more feedback with regard to what state board NDUS is thinking um, at that level, president's cabinet, those kinds of things. Um, but it's, you know, it's always concerning when a plan uh, is has potential to be changed. Um, our plan, the grandfathered plan in, in general is, um, it's an older one, um, you know, grandfathered in from when we moved over uh, to Sanford and specifically did some negotiations there. Um, the Human Resource Council um, at, at, you know, for all 11 schools specifically have, have had conversations about this. There are changes that need to be made to the plan, um, but we're just, uh, you know, we got to wait and see. I mean, this is a wait and see one. I'm not exactly sure uh, what the state board, um, what their perspective is on this. And so there's going to be a lot more conversation that's had. President Armacost, did you want to add to that? Oh, just that there, there are many conversations about how to keep the, to whoever is currently under the existing defined um, benefit plan, that uh, how do we keep it? Is this not Peggy's giving me the look. Was was this the health insurance or the defined contribution, defined benefit? I'm sorry. It was health. Okay. Oh, gotcha. Yeah, yeah. never mind. I, <laughs> like, wait there, a there might be a question on that as well. But, um, <laughs> you know, one of the things that we wrestle with across all benefits is um, when we make changes to these systems, um, how does the system actually cover the, the cost of, of increased benefits or increased pay? So just a general thought that um, uh, Vice President Stewart has been great about informing the Appropriations Committee about, about the, the, the trade-offs, about how we want to support um, uh, benefits for our, our members, um, but also um, the the need for for um, that we're identifying for the state to come in with additional funding to make sure uh, these programs are fully supported. So thanks. Thank you, President Armacost. Thank you, Peggy. Um, I'm going to direct the next question to back to Tom Bequee Bailey. Um, Tom Bequee, what can UND do to support our transgender students in light of the bills that are targeting transgender transgender people within our state? Tom Bequee, did are you able to, are you still with us? Um, all right, I'm going to, Tom Bequee, are you still with us? Hi, Melanie, I'm sorry. I was having a little bit of Zoom problem. That's what I thought I might be happening. And, yes, yes. So I apologize. Can you, can you repeat that? I'm sorry. Of course. What can UND do to support our transgender students in light of the bills that are targeting transgender people within our state? 
I think that's, a, thank you, uh, Vice President Linder. I think that's an excellent question. I think we, regardless of what's happening in with the legislative bills that are being proposed, I think we, we have to think about what we can control in this campus. And so I think that there are multiple things that are happening that continue to happen in support of uh, not only our gay, lesbian, and bisexual community, but also our transgender community uh, on campus. So, and so uh, one of the first things I will say is that um, we do have a Pride Center. We have a Pride Center director, uh, Dr. Jeff Molesky, who is leading the efforts in terms of the Pride Center. Uh, I would just say, um, particularly for our graduate students, just last night for our LGBTQ plus graduate students here on campus, um, the, the Pride Center hosted a first meeting for those graduate students. Um, and so as they work to form a, a LGBTQ plus graduate student organization. For our undergraduate students, we have multiple organizations um, for our trans and queer students. And so they find support there. There's also support through our university counseling center um, in terms of being able to offer support in that way. And then we'll see through different throughout the, the colleges and schools here at the university, while not every college university is engaging in the same um, plans and efforts as it relates to uh, transgender community, uh, we see that, um, and physically we see that we have moved away from um, um, a binary notion of gender in terms of, uh, in terms of our, our bathrooms uh, and, and other spaces. Uh, we also see that the discussions are being had in various colleges and schools as it relates to how do we make sure that we are uh, effective in our work with our students who identify as being transgender. So I will say that there are multiple efforts that are taking place on campus and we will continue those efforts. We also see um, as it relates to um, um, for individuals as it relates to their name and pronoun usage that students have the ability through Campus Connect to go in and make sure that they are putting in their uh, pronouns and that they can put the name that they're using there as well, which would then populate uh, across the system in terms of the learning management system for Blackboard and, and email and things of that nature. So uh, we are continuing to, to support our transgender students on campus and we will continue to support our transgender students on campus. As I mentioned earlier, um, as we talk about this, for me, it's important that we're thinking about um, uh, human rights and I'm moving away from a, a, conversation, a conversation rooted in politics. So those are some of the things. And again, as I said earlier, I'll continue to say, email me, reach out to me, have a conversation, and we'll continue to make sure that, that we're doing this in as, as a thoughtful manner as possible. So thank you again, Vice President Linder. Thank you. All right, I'm gonna go back to Peggy Varberg. Peggy, we have a question regarding the new performance, um, the, the annual performance template. It says, the, t um, the meets does not meet criteria, does not allow us to distinguish employee performance and is very concerning. Can you explain why was this change made and how we'll be able to assign raises based on performance? So I think there's a few issues there. So first off, the main reason that we made changes to the meets does not meets or the one through five and took the four and the five off <clears throat> uh, was really because of the significant feedback that we've gotten from staff in the last couple of years. And then specifically the significant feedback we got during the strategic plan um, development process and the valuing employees um, that staff did not, did not like it. They felt like it was not fairly managed um, in their areas, um, specifically the fours and the fives or that um, meets uh, or uh, exceeds expectations. Um, uh, and, and, and I will say that raters, no matter what they are, one through five, meets, exceeds, those kinds of things, they're very subjective. And so it's, it's a challenge to try to get it right-sized and have all supervisors sort of on the same page in terms of how they apply them. Um, so we were asked um, to do this by staff, again, significantly, and we decided that this year may be the right year to make that decision. Um, we did have a discussion with um, the president and the executive committee and were supported. Um, part of that is because historically in the past couple of bienniums, the, the, the first cycle of legislative increases um, usually have a direction, right? The, the legislators say, this is how you have to apply that. So the one qualifier in every um, every instance is that some, you can't have a does not meets. 
So you have to be meeting all expectations of, of your annual evaluation. You can't have a does not meet or, or performance issues um, because if you do, then you're not eligible for that, uh, any kind of raise, um, uh, merit increase, performance-based increase. Um, and on the side, uh, there are many elements of the university who use the language. Um, so uh, the language that the supervisor and the employees the comments that they make, the self-evaluations, the language that that supervisors put, you know, that that um, hold a lot more credence than than a rater may do. Um, so they, um, the language matters is is where I'm going with that. It's it matters that you know the leader says you have done an exceptional year, and here's why. Um, and so there's a lot of areas that will take that and they don't necessarily look at the raters, they're looking at the language and they'll make decisions based on that, you know, the projects that were done, um, the exceptional work that was done and why, what were the specifics. And what we saw over the last couple of years is there, uh, there are times when a leader may, may provide an exceeds or a four or five and there's no um, no real examples as to why. And so um, we heard that. We heard that significantly. Um, so there are ways to do, to assign values to a merit increase um, when appropriate, when we're allowed, um, based on the language. And so we, HR, will be starting a project to overhaul the staff uh, annual evaluation process, the entire process. And we will have a few um, surveys that will go out. We will have some focus groups that will go out. It will be sort of a cross-functional team um, to make sure that we're listening, we're hearing um, from staff, from leadership, you know, uh, in general. And so that um, we want this to be meaningful. And that's what we heard. It wasn't meaningful. This That, you know, the process wasn't meaningful. People uh, generally didn't, didn't find value in our current process. So we made that decision in part because there is potential that we will get an assigned merit by the legislators and we won't have really any, um, any stake in that game other than those who don't meet, which is uh, in the past few years, we've had 17, you know, 100 and some odd staff, uh, and they're, I think, high side of people that does not meet out of that large number was maybe six, six people who didn't get, didn't get because they had work that they needed to do on their performance, and we were working with them, leadership was working with them in their area, so it's a complicated answer, it's a complicated process, and we're hoping to make it a much more beneficial one um, for all parties. Thank you, Peggy. Before you jump off, um, we've got one more question for you, and that is there an update on the retirement? I know there's been conversation about the retirement benefit. Yeah, there's still a lot of conversation, and I think this is where um, President Armacost was um, going down that road. A lot of conversation in the House, and um, we'll walk into the Senate as well um, about the, the, um, the retirement process um, for our non-exempt staff with NDPERS. And so specifically, it's, it's a program that, you know, if you read about it, it's underwater. We have to figure out how to fix it. Um, there's going to be a cost to the legislators. There's going to be a cost potentially to each of the um, agencies. And, and one thing to remember is that when we talk about any of our benefits, health insurance or retirement, um, those kinds of things, those are things that, that we get through North Dakota personnel. And there are things that are applied across all state agencies, including the NDUS. So upside positives to that is that we have economy of scale. We have a lot of people in these plans. And so we're able to get products that are good. And um, it's helped us to be able to continue to offer specifically health insurance at no premium cost um, and, and fairly good plans. But um, every so often these come up and you have to review them and you have to think about them. And it's time to make some decisions on the retirement plan because it's in trouble. And so they, they need to figure out how to um, stop patching it and, and really fix it going forward. Thank you, Peggy. I'm gonna send the next question back to uh, Dr. Bailey. Um, Dr. Bailey, what is UND doing to ensure faculty, staff, and students with disabilities receive the same level of supportive, inclusive spaces that the LGBTQ plus community already received on the UND campus? Vice President Linder, thank you so much, and thank you to the individual who uh, 
who, who submitted that question. Uh, I actually want to come back into this notion of same. Uh, and I, I want us to move away from same and really start thinking about fairness and equity is, is what I center on. Um, and so I just I, I want to start there because I don't I don't want people to assume it has to be the same and things will be the same. I think we have to make sure that it, there's there's equitable um, resources, concern and and um, attention to. Um, so here's what I'll say. I think there, there are multiple fronts uh, as it relates to the work that's being done um, in, in terms of working with individuals who have different level of ability across the campus. And I'm going to also, as I'm talking out, in, invite um, Mike Pieper as well as Peggy Barberg. Um, please, you all share additional information. Um, here's what I'll say as it relates to work with students. Um, one, of the, one of the offices that we have on campus that, that uh, really um, epitomizes and, and really works for student concerns as it relates to, to disabilities is through disability services for students. Um, and so there we see a number, number of things that happen um, through that area. So students who are in need of accommodations um, as it relates to the educational environment. Um, so we know that, that that's happening. We also know that um, uh, Dr. Sarah Kaiser, who is the, who, the director for that area, also works with, with faculty, different colleges and, and schools to help them understand the process as it relates to accommodations and what students can expect and what faculty should expect in the classroom. Um, when we start thinking about um, what does it look like outside of the classroom, what does it look like in terms of the, the physical space on campus, when we start thinking about new, new construction on campus, again, I welcome uh, Mike Pieper to, to come on, but one of the things is that we're always thinking about the, um, the Disabilities Act and really we're making sure that we are, are within the, the standards, the federal standards, state standards, um, and meeting the, the physical layout. So we're thinking about those things. Um, I think we're also just thinking about physical space on campus, um, having worked with, with uh, Donna Smith and Beth Valentine, as well as Mike Pieper, just making sure that we're thinking about physical space on campus and its accessibility. Um, I know as, we're, as, we are, as we've been going through and looking at not just new construction, uh, but physical space on campus in terms of the um, doorways, making sure elevators are working, um, all of those things that we're really attending to. And so I think we continue to do that. Again, um, I welcome uh, Mike, but also um, I welcome Peggy to really talk about it from an HR perspective in terms of how we're continuing to work with uh, faculty and staff as it relates to level of building. I see Peggy's here, so thank you so much, Peggy. Thanks, Dr. Bailey. Yeah, we are... Um... Uh, have uh, we have a person in HR that manages our ADA accommodation requests for all staff and faculty, and that's Mel Arnold, um, and she's done a fabulous job with working um, with employees across all areas to um, listen, encourage, to um, figure out solutions. Um, we we work through that interactive dialogue and process um, to make sure we're listening to the person that's got requests. Um, but yes, to make sure that our our spaces are um, inclusive and open and available to those that might have are differently abled, um, those and whatever that may be. So um, it's yeah, we're we're excited to um, continue uh, conversations as we have new buildings come online, and um, you know uh, Mike's group has been receptive uh, in the planning stages to um, what e you know ADA requirements are. They're well vetted in in that law and what. What we need to do is we bring on new buildings or or repurpose or refocus or rehabilitate um, existing buildings, um, those kinds of things. Yeah. And, and I would just add, and again, Mike, probably you, you will say this better than I. I think when we start looking at new constructions, one of the things that I, I thought is a real standard of the work is looking at the Memorial Union. Um, and really the efforts were made in terms of, I think for you all who can remember the old union and, and Mike, I don't want to steal thunder here, but one of the things I know you all really worked at and, and with the, the architects and with the, the construction of it is to make sure that we remove some of those barriers in terms of step. And so the, they're removing just having one accessible um, way to get into the building now with that kind of even plane, having it being more accessible. Um, and, and so I think that we are really seeing this um, unfold, particularly with these new constructions on campus. But I think there's some intentional thinking about how do we make sure that that physically spaces on campus. And again, Mike, I see you here. So thank you so much. Yeah, I, I, the one thing I was going to add is if um, if you're hiring uh, a person with a disability, um, 
we have stu different students come on campus every year. You know, our staff will work directly with like student housing and, and we'll, before that student gets here, you know, we'll, we'll go to the dorm room and work with their um, class schedule and kind of walk the routes. We go into the classrooms to make sure um, that they're accessible and there's not gonna be any restrictions. Um, so I just throw that out as another way that, um, you know, we can catch some things in advance. So if, if you're aware of a student or an employee coming on campus, we love to hear about that and, and we'll try to be as, progress, as progressive as we can with situations that we find. Thank you all for that. I'm gonna direct our next question to Chief Clark. Chief Clark, although it may be relatively new, what do UND stance on House Bill 1404 permitting concealed firearm carry on campus, including classroom, dorms, et cetera, particularly as a middle-friendly campus, including those living with PTSD? Yeah, thank you, Melanie. Um, although I won't, I won't say what the entire university's stance is on the bill. I don't think that that's my place. I think that's more the president's place, but I, I can tell you I've had previous experience with this in another state at another institution. Um, and for it, where it was the same, basically the same law where a person that was allowed by law to possess a handgun could do so on uh, any state board of education facilities. Um, I didn't have a lot of issues in the three years that I was there. There was only a couple where someone may have left one, you know, unattended and sometimes those issues come up. And I know that this is a very emotionally charged issue and a lot of people have opinions on it. Um, you know, the, the right of self-protection and all that, you know, coming into play. Um, I'm not really sure about the part about how that would uh, apply to people with PTSD. I'm not really sure what that question is implying or the, the person asking it what the intent was. But we would, of course, uh, support the legislature in, in whatever laws that they pass, we have to carry them out, you know, from a law enforcement standpoint, from a law enforcement standpoint. So I would just leave it at that. I'm, I'm not going to make a statement on behalf of the whole university, but I can tell you I have had experience with it. Thank you, Chief Clark. President Armacost, would you like to add your thoughts on that and what the system and the state board are thinking? This is likely one that will be discussed at the state board meeting uh, on Thursday. Um, and so we'll, we'll get a better sense of what's the thoughts are on the campus. I appreciate Chief Clark's experience um, living in a state uh, where such a provision was in place. Um, this is, um, uh, there are others on campus who will share a different perspective that the presence of weapons among students, faculty and staff um, create a feeling of a lack of safety as well. And so we have to be uh, mindful of, of those perceptions as well. My goal is always to make sure we have a safe campus um, and a campus uh, where everyone feels welcome. So we need to uh, work uh, with the, the, the members of the State Board of Higher Education and try to come up with a consistent, if we can, a consistent um, uh, response uh, to this particular bill. Um, I do know um, there was a bill in the last session that uh, applied to all government buildings. Uh, so I think it was open carry or concealed carry in, in all state buildings, including universities. And uh, I don't believe that one passed. Um, so oddly, this one is just focused uh, on college campuses. Um, so uh, this is one that requires close scrutiny and uh, careful discussions with my peers. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, I'm going to direct this next question to VP Stewart. Um, VP Stewart, there was talk of having all positions paid out of appropriated funds. What is the status of this? It's very stressful when a position is funded by contracts from outside facilities or grants, especially when one supervisor talks about it frequently, and that's when the job is potentially going to add in spite of the fact that funds can only apply to a small amount of duty, significant, but significantly fund the position. Melanie, thank you for the question. Um, I'm not I, I'm going to have to interpret kind of the what the question is. We um, we don't have an intent to change the funding of all positions to appropriated positions. We don't have the funding or the ability to do that. M many of our positions are funded, and when we say appropriated, that means the funding is coming from tuition dollars as well as state dollars. 
those are not differentiated in the system. And when the government talks about appropriated positions, they are talking about um, positions that are funded with either tuition dollars um, or state. We mix that pool together. It goes into a central fund and positions are funded out of that. We also have locally funded positions, which are positions that we fund with dollars that do not come from that bucket. And those positions um, very often are uh, fund positions that either come from student fee dollars, uh, grants and contracts, grants fund positions um, based on the needs of the grants. Um, and we don't have an ability to um, guarantee those positions because they are based on um, the award and availability of the grant. We also have um, other funding sources um, that that are, you know, from services such as dining services and housing, where those positions are funded through fees that we charge to students. Um, so if that did not answer your question, please post a follow-up question. Um, what might be getting confused is we have asked the legislature as part of our request to fund the tuition portion of the salary increases so that we are able to minimize tuition increases due to the um, obviously unprecedented inflationary nature that we are living in right now. So if that was more of the question, um, we, we have submitted that request, but we do not know where that's gonna go yet, but that was part of our presentation. So um, if you have more questions about that and I wasn't able to specifically answer your question, please send a follow-up and I'll try to do my best to get back to you in writing if we run out of time today. Thanks. Thanks so much. I'm gonna direct this next question back to President Armacost. Um, President Armacost, um, Senate Bill 2239 is a great approach to solving any issues with PERS. Does NDUS or UND have a stance on that particular bill? Allow me to look at the bill tracker to see if it's uh, if the system has taken a a position on it. I, I think it might just be monitor. Um, so bear with me one second. Bear with me. Um, there are, there's one other bill too. It's um, House Bill 1040 that relates to the same, um, the same uh, retirement system uh, with the PERS system. And, uh, and so we're watching that very carefully. I mentioned this earlier that one of our biggest concerns is how do you how do you use uh, state funding to best keep those systems afloat, at least to the people that we've uh, committed uh, to having that system endure? So um, I think it's important, uh, whatever the details of the bill, I think if we've made a commitment to our employees um, uh, who are under a, a system, my position is uh, we should continue that that commitment. And um, and so there's a lot of discuss about how to finance. And my guess is 2239 uh, addresses some of those, just as, just as uh, 1040 does as well. Thanks for the question. Thank you. I'm going to direct the next question. Actually, I'm going to put two questions to one for Dr. Bailey. Dr. Bailey, um, there's a question about the disability office is an equity office. What is UND doing regarding social inclusion specifically? And then the question was kind of that's tied to it is as a continuation of the previous disability question, how is the campus facilitating social connections among and between those on campus with disabilities, such as the space at the Memorial Union? Vice President Linder, thank you so much. And again, thank you for the individuals who, who are submitting these questions. I really appreciate it. Um, I, I want to, in working to answer the questions, uh, what I'll say is uh, in terms of the um, the work that uh, Peggy Barberg is doing, um, Associate VP Barberg um, is doing in HR, as well as what we're doing in student affairs and academic affairs. I think what we're trying to do in, in terms of this work and, and looking at equity is making sure that individuals are included in our spaces. And so I brought up Memorial Union in terms of kind of physical access. Um, I think the other thing that, that you will see um, throughout is how do our offices and and I'll and I'm going to back away a little bit from disability services for students and I'll talk probably a little bit more about some of the work that SDNI student diversity and inclusion is doing um, some of the things we see um, in our pride center um, some of the things we see in student affairs and what I'll say is really 
Um, how do we encourage students to come together? And I think that's what we've been seeing um, throughout this year. And so um, when students come saying, hey, we want to make sure that there's a concern or desire to have students come together, um, I think we, we, we always support that. Um, you know, if somebody uh, has identified as having a disability or, or having some different level of ability versus individuals who are not, sometimes it may be a challenge for us to identify those individuals. But what I will say is that we continue to make space, we continue to make opportunity, we continue to have conversations. Um, and I think those things are happening. Um, I think the other thing I will say, and I want to I make sure I mention this specifically, um, is that um, the Teaching Transformation and Development Academy, TADA, um, is doing a book read this semester, um, looking at um, academic ableism um, in that book. And um, I think Lynette and maybe Ann are both on. And so I, I um, welcome any uh, comments you all want to add um, through the chat or, or otherwise. Um, but that book really gets at um, looking at disability services and institutional critiques in higher education in terms of what does uh, experiences of, of individuals who are differently abled um, look like in higher education? How do we start thinking about spaces, times, um, and really what's happening for individuals. And it really is an attempt to uh, put concerns front and center. So what I will continue to say is that, um, and I keep saying it, email me, reach out, please. Um, you know, we're not thinking of, of all the, the ways that we can continue to support and help um, our, our communities on campus, but know that we are working to do as much as we can. And so, um, so I think that's what's happening. Um, and, and if there are other questions, you know, I can, I can respond via email, but I do think we are continuing to move forward on this campus and, and really thinking about individuals who are differently able to across our institution. And Tom McQuee, there was um, a great post, an anonymous post, um, about the wealth, the wellness and health center, um, about, uh, they're offering sled hockey and goal ball, um, as two sports. Um, and in addition, there was, um, a great story. I received a phone call last fall from uh, one of the fraternities. I think it was Sigma Chi. In fact, they have a member who is in a wheelchair. And uh, not only did they create an accessible uh, fraternity house, chapter house, um, but they were also asking about the availability of getting wheelchairs. Um, so they, as as a group, could actually play wheelchair basketball over at the Wellness Center. And it's that spirit that we that we applaud and that we really relish when our, our students themselves come forward and say, uh, we want to bring people into our group who previously might not have been considered. So well done, Sigma Chi's. All right, um, I'm going to direct our next question back to Chief Clark. Um, Chief Clark, we <clears throat> were talking about the, um, the able to carry. The question came in about what about locking down classrooms in an emergency? Can you talk to that? Yeah, sure. Thank you, Melanie. This is actually an agenda item coming up in front of uh, the executive council. Um, there are several options of locking devices that we're kind of uh, ordering a few in as like a test, if you will, to see if we can uh, make sense of that and even uh, from a policy standpoint, discuss it at the university administration level, if we want to do that for all campus uh, classrooms across the university. So I don't have an answer like quite yet at this time. It is something that we've been talking about for, you know, about a month or six weeks as it has been raised up uh, through concerns. Um, and I can tell you, we're looking at it. We're looking at options, you know, of how, how we might do that. And keep in mind, you know, it doesn't necessarily make sense in all situations um, to lock the door. You know, there could be some situations if something was inside and there's some various ways that technology could be used against somebody, too, if you had the ability to lock the classroom door from inside. So it's a it's a complex problem set, um, one that many universities are probably facing today, um, deciding on what to do with that. But we are going to look at it at the uh, top level of the university. Yeah, I was just going to say um, that this is on the agenda for EC um, in the next two weeks, and so we will certainly provide further information. Um, University Senate might be the best place for us to provide our follow up and very happy to do that. And thank you for the question. And just uh, across all possible responses to, to events like this on campus. Um, Chief Clark and our emergency management office, uh, Jen Berger, um, 
hosted a tabletop exercise um, in response to active shooter cases. So, so in addition to the tactics of how do you lock down a room, uh, we, we need to make sure that all of our communications um, methods and approaches during during an emergency situation are, are tight and that they can be responsive to the needs of the campus. So thanks to Chief Clark and to Jen Berger. So I know we're running up, um, getting close to the top of the hour, but there is one um, one question, President Armacost, I'm, I'm hoping that you'll be able to answer before you give the closing remarks. And that is there an update on the director of the Indigenous Student Service Center? The position has been open for some time. Can you give a status on that? Absolutely. And I think uh, Dr. Bailey can come on as well. Um, the search is ongoing. Candidates are being interviewed currently. Um, and uh, we hope to have a new director of the Indigenous Student Center um, appointed very, very soon. Um, the, the search, um, uh, again, has taken a little bit longer. And Tom Bequee can probably share. Well, you probably can't get into too much detail about the reasons why. But, but nonetheless, this is a high priority for us. We want to make sure absolutely we get the right person for this job, um, especially given all the work that's been happening uh, with uh, Native American issues and repatriation and so forth. Tom Bequee. Um, uh, thank you, President Armacost. I'm just going to iterate what President Armacost has said, that this is of high importance to us, and we're in the process of reviewing and interviewing candidates for the position. Um, and so it has been taken very serious. And um, as many of you have already experienced, um, when our candidates are ready to do their presentations on campus, uh, a notice will go out with the Zoom link so people can attend those sessions. So we're again, we are, are taking it very serious and we are hoping to have to hire um, in the very near future. So that's, that's, that's pretty much all I can say at this point. Yep. Thanks, Dr. Bailey. And um, I will uh, just add one other note about a, a related position, and that is uh, we're hiring a NAGPRA compliance liaison. Uh, this is a person who's going to oversee for the years to come our compliance with uh, the Native American Grave Protection and Restoration Act, um, which our repatriation efforts fall under. So this is a person who will work closely with the campus community, uh, with the, the, the support contractors who are actually doing the technical work, uh, managing the overall project, liaising with the uh, federal government, and uh, most importantly, building close relationships with the tribal nations. Um, so this is another position that's currently advertised and candidates are, are being reviewed as, as I speak. Um, so that's that's good news. Um, and in the final minute or so, let me just thank everybody for tuning in. I know that there were likely members of, of the press who have signed in. Hopefully this gives you some good information about happenings on the campus. And most importantly, I hope that the information we provide to our members is, uh, is useful. Know that we might not have answered every question perfectly or with enough detail. Please reach out directly to the people who spoke to you today. We'd be delighted to give you more information, uh, whether in writing or, or verbally over the phone. So um, by all means, um, reach out and get the answers that you need. You deserve it. Um, so with that, let's uh, get on with the day and uh, enjoy, and we will see you soon, whether it's on video or on events like this. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you.